The Life of St. Patrick, Apostle of Ireland by Father William Morris Neil Obstat, E.S. Co. Imprimatur Henricus Edardus, 1878 Chapter 1 The Church in the 4th Century Birth and Parentage of Patrick Early Miracles His Six Years' Captivity in Ireland A great part of the history of the Church may be found in the lives of her saints, and in this respect sacred and secular history resemble each other, for in both our attention is concentrated on the few great men who were the representatives as well as the rulers of their age. The century in which St. Patrick was born, the fourth after Christ, was one in which God wonderfully revealed his power, and his instruments are ever in proportion to the work required. The character of our saint, as one of God's chief agents at that time, comes before us invested with all the supernatural grandeur of the age in which he lived. It was then that the promise made by God through his prophet seemed on the eve of its complete and manifest fulfillment. The stone that struck the statue became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. The church had scarcely come forth from the catacombs when the Roman Empire yielded place and retired before her, surrendering the imperial city itself to the vicar of Christ, while paganism, as it was nothing more than a religion of the state, was extinguished by the power that had made it. When Constantine, in the last exercise of his office of Pontifex Maximus, turned the gods out of the temples, setting some to stand in the streets, and others in even more ennoble places. It is true that heresy and the usurpations of the civil power soon chilled the high hopes which had been enkindled when the Lord on earth became a Christian. Still, it is remarkable that for some time fidelity to the church and material prosperity went together. It was the first Christian emperor who reunited the empire, and it was Constantine, and after him the great Theodosius, who upheld the majesty of the Roman name, and gave it back some of its old glory. But the very year that the latter died, 395, the barbarians, who in the century before had shaken the foundations of the empire, broke once more upon it and then its long and terrible agony began. St. Patrick lived through the years of Alaric, Attila, and Genseric, and saw the final extinction of the empire of the West, and it was in the midst of the desolation of those days, all the more appalling from the contrast with what had gone before, that God gave him the heart to undertake the conversion of one of the fiercest of those races who was then grinding the ancient world into dust. His life carries us away from the spectacle of the struggle which was going on round the great centers of the Roman power, between the old civilization and barbarism, and reveals how it fared with those who lived in countries which formed the frontiers of the empire. When the signal was given and the legions which for centuries had garrisoned the world began their retreat on Rome, many of her colonists, who, under the shelter of their protection, had gathered together possessions made homes for themselves in the distant provinces, seemed to have clung to the countries which they had adopted, and, like the stragglers of a retreating army, it was they who suffered most from the enemy. To this class our saint's family belonged, and his life has a special interest from the light which it throws on the state of things in our own part of the world at a time of which we have so few records. It tells us how frail was the tenure of life and liberty for those who were dwelling upon the shores of Gaul or Britain, when Scots from Ireland and Saxons from the banks of the Elbae and Rhine scoured the Irish and English channels in search of spoil and adventure, or made inroads on the mainland when they had swept the seas. It was at a time, too, when those who fell in war seemed to have had the least share in the woes of the vanquished for captivity then meant slavery. Patrick's mother, Conchessa, was the first to drink of that bitter chalice of captivity and bondage which was afterwards to be her son's portion, and in the stern school of adversity she learned those lessons which fitted her to be the mother of a saint. She was a near relative of St. Martin. Some writers call her his sister, others his niece, and she must have been carried captive from France before the great saint was elected bishop of Tours. The circumstances of her seizure by the barbarians are not recorded. We only know that she was sold, and that Potius was the name of her master. 
The old chronicler gives a touching picture of the grace and dignity of the high-born slave, and tells us how in the end they won the heart of her master's son, Calphurnius, and how he married her, and that from this union sprang the child who was destined to be the light of the western world, and the greatest wonder-worker of his age. St. Patrick was born in 373. He tells us in his letter to Coroctius that his father held the office of Decuro under the Roman government, but the place of his residence and the country of the saint's birth are still matters of controversy. From the difficulty of identifying the old names of place given in St. Patrick's own confession and other ancient records, he speaks of his relatives among the Britons, but this does not help us, as in his time there were British Celts in France as well as in Great Britain. So as regards the rival claims of France and Scotland to our saint, it is prudent to imitate the diffidence of that writer who excuses himself from attempting a decision in the matter, saying that he does not wish to deprive any nation of the right or title that they may have to the saint, for St. Patrick is too rich a jewel to be lost but upon good evidence. Our saint must have had the blood of many races in his veins. His mother family came from Pomonia, the modern Hungary, and settled at Pavia after the birth of St. Martin. Probus and others attribute a Celtic origin to St. Patrick, but judging from the names of his ancestors, there is little doubt that they had intermarried with Roman colonists. It is also worthy of remark that when the saint alludes to the nobility of his family, he identifies it with the Roman dignity of his father. Thus, in his epistle to Coroxius, he says, According to the flesh I am of noble birth, my father being a decuro, I have bartered my nobility for the good of others, and for this I have neither shame nor regret. I have become a slave in Christ to a foreign nation for the ineffable glory of that eternal life which is the Christ Jesus our Lord. In his confession he mentions that both his father and grandfather were in holy orders. Now, this was written when his work was nearly done, concluding with the words, This is my confession before I die. It seems to have been specifically addressed to that monastic clergy on whom, from the first, he imposed so rigid a law of celibacy, and, as he mentions the fact without comment, we must conclude that the saint merely alluded to what has been permitted in all ages of the church, when married men, like St. Gregory of Nyssa or St. Hilary, being separated from their wives by death or mutual consent, have taken holy orders. St. Patrick was one of those upon whom God set his seal even in infancy, manifesting by miraculous gifts and favors the designs which he had formed concerning him. The priest to whom the child was brought for baptism was blind, and no water could be procured for the sacrament. But a sudden inspiration, the priest took the hand of the infant, and with it made the sign of the cross upon the ground. For with a fountain broke forth in which the priest baptized the child, then washing his own eyes in the miraculous waters, his sight was restored. As the child grew in years, the favors of God were multiplied. When an inundation threatened the house in which he dwelt, he dipped his fingers in the advancing waters, and having flung a few drops back again, making the sign of the cross in the name of the Holy Trinity, the flood receded, and those who looked on saw sparks of fire falling from the hand of the child. Another time, when in the fields with his sister, Lupita, she fell, and striking her head against a stone, wounded herself so severely that she seemed to be dying. When Patrick saw this, he wept aloud, and raising her, made the sign of the cross over the wound, which healed at once, a white scar alone remaining as evidence of the miracle. Moreover, it is recorded that God gave him the power to raise the dead. One day, when Patrick was carried by his uncle to a great assembly of the people, suddenly the man fell down dead in the midst. At first the crowd was silent, and then arose the cries and lamentations of the friends of the dead man, and his wife, turning to the child, whose power with God was so well known, said, Why, thou Gila, dost thou let the man who was carrying thee die? When Patrick heard this, he ran, and putting his arms round his uncle's neck, said, Arise, and let us go home. And at his words, the dead man was restored to life. To this child was also given that power over the brute creation which God has sometimes bestowed upon his saints, in which we see a restoration in favor of innocence and purity, 
of one of those gifts which man has lost by the fall. At his prayer, a wolf brought back a lamb which he had carried away from the flock, and, like St. Thomas of Hereford and St. Joseph of Cupertino in latter times, St. Patrick raised dead animals to life. The miracles and external signs of God's favor to the saint in his pure and holy childhood have been recorded, but the unseen gifts of grace poured upon his soul are hidden from us. We may, however, in some way estimate them from the fact that at sixteen his soul was found prepared for and equal to trials before which even a veteran soldier of the cross might recoil. At this age, the horrible scenes of his mother's captivity were repeated. An armed band landed on the coast and laid the country waste. His parents were slain, and he and two of his sisters carried into captivity. These were Lupita, mentioned already, who bore the white wound as a memorial of her brother's love and power, and another named Tigris. Many thousands, the saints tells us in his confession, were carried into slavery by the enemy, and the children being separated, knew not that they were companions in sorrow. Three of the ancient lives of the saints, edited by Colgan, declare that the enemy came from Ireland, whereas the Tripuratite life says that the expedition was commanded by the seven sons of Fechtmod, king of Britain. But as it also adds that there were in exile expatriarchalti, there is no difficult in the fact of their being on the side of the Irish. The fleet set sail for Ireland, passed along the coast for the purpose, apparently, of finding a market for the sale of the captives, for they sold the sisters in Luth, and passing northwards, the boy was purchased by a chieftain in Antrim named Milko, who sent him into the mountains to tend his sheep. This treatment of captives taken in war was the common thing in those days, and the Irish were no worse than their neighbors, but it was one of those practices which in after years called forth the saints' most burning denunciations, and when, nearly eight centuries after the time of his own captivity, the Irish seemed to have forgotten his teaching, and slave-dealing amongst them had assumed such gigantic proportions that Henry the Second made their purchase and possession of English slaves a pretext for his invasion, St. Patrick seemed to speak again to his children by the Council of Armagh, which, in 1171, to appease the wrath of God, decreed that all English slaves in Ireland should be emancipated. In his confession, St. Patrick attributes the calamities which had fallen upon him to his own sins. He says, I was carried captive into Ireland with many thousands of men, as we deserved, for we had not guarded the commandments, nor obeyed our priests who taught us the way of salvation. Such is his own account, but it is not safe to take the saints as witnesses against themselves, and we may fairly see in these words an instance of that holy exaggeration into which humility often seems to lead them when speaking of themselves. The passage which follow gives a very different idea of St. Patrick's spiritual state at the time. After I had come to Ireland, I was daily tending sheep, and many times in the day I prayed, and more and more the love of God and his faith and fear grew in me, and the spirit was stirred, so that in a single day I have said as many as a hundred prayers, and in the night nearly the same, so that I remained in the woods and upon the mountains, and before the dawn I was called to prayer by the snow, the ice, and the rain, and I did not suffer from them, nor was there any sloth in me, as I see now, because then the spirit was burning within me. Milko proved a hard master, but he must have seen that there was something wonderful in this boy. It is probable, also, that he was not entirely a stranger to those strong impressions of the supernatural which even at that time seemed to have characterized his nation. One night, in a dream, Patrick all on fire appeared to him, entering the house, flames issuing from his mouth, nostrils, eyes, and ears. Milko repelled the burning hair of the boy as he approached, so as not to allow the flames to touch him. Then they seemed to turn aside and envelop and consume his two little daughters, who were lying in the same bed. After this, the wind arose, and lifting the ashes, bore them to many parts of Ireland. When Milko awoke, he lay pondering on the strange vision, and summoning Patrick, asked him if he could interpret it. Then Patrick, to whom God had already begun to reveal the secrets of the future, answered, 
The fire which you saw coming forth from me is that of the faith in the Holy Trinity with which I am entirely illuminated, and which I endeavor to preach to you, but my words will find no place in you, because your blind soul shuts out the light of divine grace, and you will die in the darkness of unbelief. But at my preaching your two daughters will believe in the true God, and serve God in holiness and justice during their lives, then, dying the death of the just, their ashes, that is to say, their relics, shall be carried to many parts of Ireland, and will bring health and blessings to many. We gather from these words that even at this time he had received a revelation from God on the work for which he was destined, and the account he left us of the sublime heights of prayer to which he had been raised, prove that the boy's soul had already begun to live in that invisible world where God speaks and works through his saints. Probus relates that it was at this time that the angel Victor, afterwards the saint's constant guide and adviser, began to visit him every seventh day, and spoke to him as a man is wont to speak to man. St. Patrick, as it is to be expected from one in whom the desire of self-abasement amounted to a passion, makes no mention of this in his confession, and evidently we should have known nothing of his gifts of prayer in his youth, if it were not that he was led to contrast it with what he called the sloth of his old and worn-out body, upon which he had no mercy. Six years were thus passed in slavery, during which period Patrick had time to acquire the Irish language, and learn many things about the people which were afterwards of use to him, and then he was told to fly. One night, he tells us in his confession, I heard a voice in my sleep saying, Thou dost fast well, fasting, thou shalt soon go to thine own country. And again, after a little time, I had an answer saying, Behold, thy ship is ready. And the place was not near, but perhaps a distance of two hundred miles, and I had never been in the place, and knew none of the people who lived there. Now a journey to a distance of two hundred miles must have been southward, and as the south coast of Ireland would naturally be his point of departure in sailing for France, this part of the narrative confirms the opinion that France, and not Scotland, was the saint's own country to which he was directed in the vision. It is inconceivable that he should have travelled to Bantry Bay in order to reach Scotland, whose shores are visible from Antrim. He continues, After this I fled, and left the man with whom I had been for six years, and I came in the strength of the Lord, who guided my way for good, and I had no fear until I reached the ship. On the day of my arrival the ship had moved out of her place, and I asked that I might be taken board and sail with them, but the master was unwilling, and answered angrily, By no means attempt to come with us. When I heard the answer, I turned away to seek the cottage where I had been lodged, and on the way I began to pray, and before my prayer was ended I heard one of them shouting with a loud, Come quickly, for these men are calling thee, and returning at once they addressed me and said, Come, we receive thee in good faith, let us be friends in whatever way you will. The part of the confession which follows is very obscure, but we rather from it that the saint preached to these men and converted them to Christianity. He continues, After three days we reached the land, and for twenty-eight days journeyed through an uninhabited country. The men's provisions failed and they suffered grievously from hunger. And one day the master said to me, What sayest thou, O Christian? Thy God is mighty, and can do all things. Why cannot you then pray for us, since we are nigh to death with hunger, and it will go hard with us ever to see the face of man again? Then I said to them painfully, Turn in faith to the Lord my God, to whom nothing is impossible, that he may send us abundant food upon our way, for his storehouses are in all places." And by the help of God so it came to pass, for behold, a herd of swine appeared on the way before our eyes, and the men killed a great number, and remained there for two nights greatly strengthened, for already many have been left half dead on the road. After this they gave the greatest thanks to God, and I was honored in their eyes. The saint, however, had soon reason to sorrow over his converts, who still clung to their pagan superstitions, for, finding wild honey, they offered it in sacrifice, and then gave some to St. Patrick, who tasted, but when he was aware of the evil use to which it had been put, he was filled with grief and indignation, and in reparation he took no food for twenty days. Footnote. 
This fast to St. Patrick is one of the instances of extraordinary and protracted abstinence given by Pope Benedict the Fourteenth in his treatise on beatification and canonization. End footnote. He does not accuse himself for any fault in this matter, although so ready to condemn himself, but it seems that he had to suffer for the sins of others. For that very night a terrible temptation assailed him, which he thus describes. On the same night, in my sleep, I was fiercely tempted by Satan, which I shall remember as long as my body and soul hold together. There fell, as it were, a great stone upon me, and all my limbs were paralyzed. Then it came in some way into my mind to call upon Elias, and at that moment I saw the sun rise in the heavens, and while I called with all my strength upon Elias, behold, the splendor of the sun fell upon me, and at once shook off the weight, and I believe that Christ my Lord cried out for me, and I hope that so it will be in the day of my distress. The saint adds that after some time he was again taken captive, but that he was liberated at the end of two months, and after this he and his companions arrived at their destination. We have seen that already the fires of apostolic zeal were burning within him, and therefore we may conclude that from this time St. Patrick set himself to prepare for the mission which God had revealed to him.